Hello, Grave Scalkers, and welcome to another installment of Graves Corner, my little place where we can talk about horror in all of its aspects. Now, my last couple of Graves Corners were more personal. There was the first one that was about my scariest story. There was last week's, which was about my top three weirdest fears. And the one in the middle was a little mini movie that I put out. So I thought today we'd bring in the horror movies. Today we're going to go all the way back to October, where I had a Halloween watch list that I created and was following. Turns out that because Halloween Kills did not come out, you could watch every single Nightmare on Elm Street, including the remake, every single Friday the 13th, including the reboot, Freddy vs. Jason, all of the Halloween movies, including the Rob Zombie reboots, and the newest Halloween movie that came out in 2018, and they equaled 31 movies exactly. I call this watch list my Big Three Halloween watch list. So today, I'm going to take you movie by movie and give you my opinions on each of them. Not exactly a full-blown review on them because it is 31 movies, but not necessarily spoiler free, so I would have your spoiler alerts up in case you haven't watched any of these, or if you haven't watched some of them. All right, so let's get into it. Remember, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up and click that bell icon so that you get notifications when I come out with a new video. I am trying to put these out every Thursday. So I decided to start off with the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of Freddy Krueger as a villain. He is the most fun to cosplay. I call this my Frederica Krueger. So I decided I would start off with one of my favorites. Of course, you have the first Nightmare on Elm Street. It is one of the few that are actually very scary in the entire series. Classic for a reason. Wes Craven is a genius. Robert England is a star. This movie gave us Johnny Depp and Heather Langenkamp and of course the incredibly sexy John Saxon who unfortunately passed away I believe this year and that was really sad because he is definitely a zaddy. Then I moved on to part two which to be honest I had never seen until I did this watch list. I've only seen the beginning of it and I also saw parts of it through documentaries. I knew that they called it the gay nightmare in Elm Street but I didn't care about that. When I was a kid and I tried watching this I wasn't interested in this movie because it took them so long to actually kill somebody. And I wanted a big horror movie. I think this movie delivers in terms of relationships and character development. However, if you're looking for a lot of scares and a lot of gore, I feel like this movie kind of loses something. And I'm not sure it really contributes to the Friday story. However, it's not a terrible movie. It's definitely one you're going to want to watch if you want the entire Nightmare on Elm Street experience. Now moving on to part three, Dream Warriors. This movie is fantastic. It has this really gothic style to it where you have this old nun and this very dramatic cemetery like scenery the central location of the entire movie is this very creepy mental hospital where these kids the last of the Elm Street children are being housed because they are trying to commit suicide so not only are you dealing with this dream monster but you're dealing with the idea of suicide and medications. Bonus points because you also see Heather Langenkamp and John Saxon revive their roles as members of the Thompson family. This one also has one of my favorite deaths in it. Welcome to prime time, bitch. Moving on to part four, Dream Warriors. Dream Warriors has some of the best special effects in it. However, I feel like the story itself is a little choppy and you don't get to know the characters as much as you would like. First of all, they kill off all the survivors from the previous one. And other than Alice, I really don't feel attached to any of the characters. And it feels more like a walkthrough of what Freddy does than an actual story. However, the special effects and Robert England really bring life to this movie. The cockroach death is definitely one of my favorites and I remembered that one my entire childhood. Then we come up to part five, which is the dream child, which I do not understand why this movie gets so much hate. It has some of my favorite deaths in the motorcycle feature fuel injection scene and Greta's death scene where she is being fed herself until she dies. Unfortunately, they do cut out a lot of the gore from those death scenes, so they miss a little bit of something, but the storyline
lines around them are really good. On top of that, they do bring back Alice from part four, so you do have a character that you're really rooting for. And there's this whole weird, like, politics about keeping a child that might be pure evil. Or on the other hand, saving a child from death as well as from pure evil. Part five does not get enough credit, and I will stand by that, that it is definitely one of my favorites. Then we come on part six, which is Freddy's dead, which of course he never really was. That's a complete lie. I want to give part six so much more credit. They bring back Johnny Depp, and they have this great scene with Alice Cooper as Freddy's father, and they even have Tom and Roseanne Arnold appear. However, I just don't think that the movie is as clever as I think they wanted it to be. They tried to throw you off as to who Freddy's relative is, but I feel like it was obvious from the start. And then on top of that, the deaths that are in it, most of them are pretty cartoony. And the dialogue could have been a little bit better. It was a fun watch, but it didn't amaze me or scare me in the way the previous movies did. Then we come up on New Nightmare, where Wes Craven returns in one of the best movies in the entire series since the first one and part three, which he kind of had a hand in writing. Totally meta, pre-scream. You have Heather Langenkamp playing herself. You have Miko, I believe that's his name, playing her son. And he was like the it child for the 90s and for horror because he played Gage in Pet Cemetery. John Saxon comes back and plays John Saxon, as well as Nancy's father. And Wes Craven and Bob Shea come back to play themselves. It's brilliant from beginning to end. Freddy is actually scary in this one. The set pieces are completely dramatic, and it's just a great movie. And of course, they came out with a Nightmare on Elm Street reboot that led nowhere, so I'm not going to devote a lot of time talking about it. Nightmare on Elm Street without Robert England is just not Nightmare on Elm Street. I feel like if they're ever going to have a Nightmare on Elm Street where they have a different guy playing the villain, they have to have some sort of sequence where you see Robert England actually passing the torch to a new killer. And the person has to have a personality like Robert England. Otherwise, it's just not going to work and people are just not going to be able to accept it. They don't want a generic killer. They want a quippy, dark, creepy, child killer type like Robert England comes off as. Sorry, Robert England. I love you. I actually have a crush on you, but as Freddy, you're pretty creepy. The story is not horrible, it's just not original. And other than Kyle Gallner, who I like as an actor, and for some reason I see him die in a lot of the things I watch with him in it, I didn't really care about any of the other actors and actresses in the movie. On top of that, A Nightmare on Elm Street is really known for its practical effects, and the reboot was very much about CGI. I just didn't like the look of it. I watched it when it first came out, and I watched it for this watch list, and I think I'm done watching it. And that's all I'm gonna say about it. Now, Freddy does make a return in Freddy vs. Jason, but I didn't watch this movie until I went through all of my Friday the 13th movies, so we will get to that later. Let's review. I will say that out of all of the movies I watched for Nightmare on Elm Street, part three is still my favorite. I think it's actually scary. I feel like there are real consequences. I feel it adds to the Freddy backstory very well, as well as brings back beloved characters. I think it reasonably opens the door to new characters. And top that, you have Freddy's mother ghost, spoiler alert, who brings this very ghost gothic presence to her. So number three definitely stands above the rest. Okay, moving on to the Friday the 13th series. Now this series I think has the most movies in any of the series that we're talking about. So let's get through them. Part one, classic whodunit movie. And we all know at this point, and if you don't, fast forward a few seconds. But the rest of us know that it was Jason's mother the entire time. And then of course you have the big jump scare at the end where Jason pops out of the lake. None of this makes sense for what follows where Jason is all of a sudden alive. Except for my theory that up until a certain point, he was never really dead to begin with. He was a kid whose mother thought he drowned, but really he had been in hiding at the camp this entire time. Saw his mother get beheaded, and that is where part two picks up. Where Jason, fully grown after hiding for so long, goes on a murderous rampage. We're introduced to probably one of the best final girls in all of final girldom, Ginny, who actually has an understanding of child psychology and therefore is able to identify with Jason and the pain he went through seeing his mom get beheaded, which ultimately saves her life. However, there is this dream sequence at the end where we're not sure whether or not there was this cute little lapso apso or shih tzu dog that appears and we think we saw the dead dog in the woods at one point, but then the dead dog appears at the door at the end before Jason jumps through the window. 
So, this might be the only movie where Jason kills a dog. And even though I love part two, that, that loses points right there. However, the dog might be alive. We don't know. Moving on to part three, which is in 3D. And if you can get the 3D version, you should. Although, I don't know if I can find any really good working 3D glasses. I got 3D glasses, and they just don't work that well. The red is off or something. But not only do we have this great 3D effect that's in it, and it's, it's cheesy when they use it, but it's still fun. But we also have a different Friday the 13th score that's a disco-fied version of it. And it's a lot of fun. Really puts you in the 80s mood. We're introduced to final girl Chris and the fact that she may have been at some point sexually assaulted by Jason. Which to me adds to my theory that he had been in hiding this entire time when everybody else had thought he drowned. And while in hiding, he attempted to sexually assault a person. We're not actually sure if he was successful. At the end, Jason is supposedly dead and taken to a hospital and that is where part four picks up, which technically makes part four Saturday the 14th. They also call part four the final chapter, which is a big fat lie because it's not even halfway through the series at that point. Corey Feldman plays Tommy Jarvis, the first iteration of Tommy Jarvis, who becomes a character that reappears in the next couple of movies and frankly one of my favorite characters in the slasher genre. Plus little Corey Feldman, adorable. If you get a chance to watch the Crystal Lake Memories, he actually narrates that documentary, so I highly recommend watching it. Part 4 also has the infamous Crispin Glover dance scene that everybody makes fun of, and rightfully so. But Crispin's character is also really lovable, and I really wish that he would embrace the fact that he did this movie, because I, I think he, he likes to ignore the fact that he was part of the Friday the 13th series, just like Kevin Bacon in Part 1. Which is hilarious, because Kevin Bacon's been in like a sh ton of horror movies since. He's just really good at it. You have an older man playing Jason, but he's a stuntman, and he is very cat and mouse in his moves, and it actually brings a little bit of, of a new type of fear to the character. So I really like this Jason. Not my favorite Jason, but I do like what he brings to the character. Part 4 ends where I think Jason actually has a death for the first time. And then we come to Part 5, which during my watch list, watching Part 5 was the first time I ever ever watched A New Beginning in its entirety. I'd only watched it in documentaries at that point. Part 5 mimics Part 1 in that it's a whodunit. Jason doesn't actually exist, he's supposedly been cremated, and Tommy Jarvis, who killed him in Part 4, is at this mental institution because he can't deal with the trauma that he suffered when Jason was alive, killing his mother and his friends. A really angry guy ends up killing somebody else at the mental institution, and then all of a sudden, all these other deaths start happening. Even though this guy, this really angry guy I believe gets arrested. I won't reveal to you who the killer was and why this person was killing everybody, but it's pretty obvious. I mean, I, I already knew because I watched the documentaries, but watching it, there were signs all over the place that the person who did it was really off from the beginning. There's some great deaths in this one too. Big boobs. So, you know, if you're into boobs, this is definitely a movie for you. And it ends with us wondering if Tommy Jarvis is going to become the new Jason. Then we come to part six. Part six is is different from all the other Jasons in that it has a different tone. With all the other Friday the 13th movies, there's very much a slasher genre basic tone to it. They're going to a location, people are getting killed. With part six, we have the very first incarnation of zombie Jason. And because of this, he's way more powerful, the deaths are way more brutal, and the settings are way more darker. And in fact, part six opens up Camp Crystal Lake and children are at the camp. So there's a whole new level of fear because you don't know if Jason is going to kill a kid. Part six has some of my favorite lines. The kids are brilliant in this movie and my favorite death is in it. The whole paintball scene and the misogynist with the machete and getting his arm ripped off. It's funny. It's also got a bit of meta humor in there. The only thing missing from it was that there was going to be an introduction into who Jason's father was and they cut it out. But I I think there's a comic book where they actually left that part in. So I suggest going to look for that. On to part seven, where we have the first time Kane Hodder plays Jason and the star is born. Kane Hodder is absolutely brilliant as Jason. And even though his movies are not my favorites in the entire series, he really does bring a life to Jason that just wasn't there before. In part seven, New Blood, we're introduced to Tina who has psychokinetic powers and ends up becoming a really huge threat to Jason. 
but also is the reason why he's revived from the lake after part 6. There's a few pretty forgettable characters in the cast of teenagers. However, Tina and her psychologist are really great. There are a few great death scenes in this as well, and if you want to see Jason meet his match, this is a great movie to see that. Then we move on to part 8, which... <sighs> God, Jason Takes Manhattan. I don't hate this movie, but it is the most ridiculous of all the Jason movies, in my opinion. Because there is no legitimate way you are getting from Crystal Lake, an enclosed lake on a cruise ship, to New York City. There's, there's just no... There's no water pathways to get there. So maybe as a kid, I didn't care. But as an adult and knowing more about geography, and how bodies of water work. It, it bugs me. However, we do have the return of Kane Hodder as Jason. We do get to see Jason in New York, although it takes forever for him to get there. But of course it does, because the ship has to travel on tri land. Logically. And it has one of the most memorable death scenes where Jason literally punches a guy's head off. So it's not without its charm. Then of course we go to part 9, which for some reason I think is, is one of the most hated in the entire series. And I disagree. Part 9 was one of the Jasons that I was raised on, and I think the unique storyline behind it is fantastic. Yes, okay, you don't technically see Jason for more than the beginning and the very end. However, Jason's evil does jump from body to body. And while we're not given a reason why he's alive after part 8, I don't think it's needed. It's like we're dropped in the middle of a movie we didn't know was made, and we get to see him die, but then he gets revived through other people. And we find out that he has more family members that we didn't know he had. So this movie adds to the backstory, and I love that. Also, we get a hint that Freddy vs. Jason is coming up. I just don't think there were people ready for this type of Friday the 13th movie, but I loved it. Moving on to part 10, which is Jason X. I love this movie. I can't explain it why I love this movie. It's not great. The special effects are weird. Maybe they were good for their time, but it's very bright and blue and not like any of the other Jason movies in tone. There are some great characters that I actually root for and great deaths, the nitroglycerin or whatever it was, a girl gets her head put into and then shattered against a desk. I thought that was brilliant. And then you get Uber Jason, who when you think Jason is completely destroyed, gets put back together by nanobots. Who saw that coming? And then of course there's the idea of Earth 2 and Jason is now on Earth 2. And bonus points for having David Cronenberg killed at the beginning of the movie. Jason X is one that everybody should watch. After part 10, I watched Freddy vs. Jason, which I was incredibly excited for when I saw it in theaters, and I bought it on DVD as soon as it was available. Do I love this movie? No. Do I hate this movie? No. I love Monica Kina as Lori. Getting to see Freddy actually fight Jason and how they ended up trying to team up together first and then it all gets messed up. I thought that was a brilliant storyline. The fight scenes at the end, mwah. Jason Ritter and the guy who looks like Jay from Jay and Silent Bob, love those characters. But there was just something about it that didn't feel right to the genre. Like if somebody described it in one of the documentaries I watched that it felt like you were watching a WWE match. And it does. It does. It feels like it's more about the fight than about the story that leads to the fight. And there's a storyline there, especially between Lori and her father. And they bring up the pills that were used in part three of Nightmare on Elm Street. I thought that was a brilliant reference. However, it's missing some sort of darkness that you get watching a Nightmare on Elm Street movie or a Friday the 13th movie. Kind of like part six of Nightmare on Elm Street, where it was a little more cartoony than it should have been. However, that's not going to stop me from watching it in the future. I do own the DVD. Then I watched the Friday the 13th reboot. And let me tell you, this movie does not get enough credit. The storyline around Jason finding somebody that looks like his mother and kidnapping her instead of killing her, the brother trying to search for the sister. You know, I'm close with my brothers, so I feel like I relate to this movie a little bit. And I'm probably more likely to love a movie that I relate to. And how am I going to hate a movie that has Jared Padalecki in it? He's just amazing. Supernatural. You have a cast of characters who I actually think are pretty lovable except for the one guy that is supposed to be hated and then gets one of the best deaths in the entire movie. I really enjoy the guy who played Jason too. Now, is this movie without its flaws? No, it definitely has some flaws. However, I like it in that it's so obscure as to where it would fall in the Jason universe that it could be a sequel without you knowing whether it's a sequel or not instead of a replacement for the first and the second movies. And that brings me to the end of my Jason franchise.
franchise. What is my favorite movie out of all of these movies? It's part six. It absolutely is part six, which I forgot to mention. Brought back Tommy Jarvis, played by Tom Matthews, who is my favorite iteration of Tommy Jarvis. He's charming, he's funny, and I love that they brought him back for the fan film Never Hike Alone and Never Hike in the Snow. And if you haven't watched those, they're on YouTube, go watch them. But part six, like part three in Nightmare on Elm Street, has this very gothic feel to it. The scenes are very epic and dark. The death scenes are incredible and unrealistic, but realistic for a man that was brought back by lightning bolts and is a complete zombie monster, which by the way, his resurrection scene is completely terrifying. So it holds a total special place in my heart. Also, every single camp counselor in that movie is ridiculously likable and memorable. Part six is one of those movies I could fall asleep watching because it's just so comforting, like a warm blanket. So it's definitely my number one. Now moving on to the final part of my watch list, which of course was the Halloween series because that way I got to watch a Halloween movie on Halloween. Now let's start off with the original. Jamie Lee Curtis, love her. She reminds me of my mom, which is kind of weird. We're introduced to Dr. Loomis, who is one of the most important characters in slasher history. And of course, this is classic because we have no idea why Michael Myers does what Michael Myers does, other than the fact that he escaped from an insane asylum after killing his sister when he was a kid, and as an adult, goes around killing a bunch of babysitters. It's not that gory, but it is dark, and you do really get attached to Jamie Lee's character, Laurie Strode. Moving on to part two. The effects and the deaths are definitely gorier. I know that John Carpenter says that he didn't really care about there being a part two, but I feel like part two is a favorite amongst a lot of people, and I can see why. It's way more dramatic. You get a love interest for Laurie Strode, and then you get the backstory that Laurie is actually the sister of Michael Myers. Spoiler alert. Yeah, I guess it's kind of scary that, you know, there's no reason for him to do what he's doing. But if you're going to do several movies about a character, I like that you add something to the backstory. Part two ends and you think Michael Myers and Dr. Loomis are dead. Part three happens and it has nothing to do with Michael Myers whatsoever, but Tom Atkins is amazing. Part three was Season of the Witch and the idea was that the Halloween movies would be part of an anthology where every movie would be a different story. However, because parts one and two were from the same storyline, people hated part three when it first came out. However, if you take part three separately on its own, I agree that it's actually a pretty decent movie. It's got your cheesy 80s effects and a great 80s soundtrack and an actually pretty decent storyline. Something to do with a cult of basically witches and they steal a part of Stonehenge and they're trying to make a ritual sacrifice of children and the way they go about it is so gross and gory and memorable and terrifying. So I think this movie is highly underrated and should be watched. Moving on to part four, The Return of Michael Myers, which gives us Jamie, who is actually the daughter of Laurie Strode, played by Danielle Harris, who has become a major player in the horror scene and I absolutely love her. She was a fantastic child actress and seeing her in harm's way was absolutely terrifying. Like part six of Friday the 13th, you're waiting for Michael Myers to kill a kid. And because she's Laurie Strode's daughter, that means she's also a relative of Michael Myers. And so of course he has to try to kill her. Michael Myers didn't die at the end of part two after all. Turns out he was just kind of asleep for a while and he reawakens around Halloween Eve and is searching for his niece so that he can kill her. Dr. Loomis also returns because it turns out he didn't die either. And Jamie has been adopted by new family because her mom passed away, supposedly, and craziness ensues. Now there are some amazing deaths in this, including one death from a boyfriend stealing woman who basically gets impaled by a shotgun instead of shot by the shotgun. That's a pretty great death. And then at the end of the movie, you think that Danielle is going to take on the mantle of being the next Michael Myers. But then you find out in part five that she didn't actually kill her adopted parents. She just kind of stabbed the mom, but the mom was okay. Part five is pretty forgettable. The cops in it are not that smart. Danielle Harris is still great and this movie has a lot of heart because of her. Her adopted sister Rachel is barely in the movie and is replaced by this woman named Tina who is possibly the most annoying character I've ever met in a slasher film. Dr. Loomis does come back and is a little on the crazier side and kind of uses Jamie as bait. And really other than Jamie and Dr. Loomis who Dr. Loomis is kind of on the edge there, there really aren't a lot of likable characters in this movie. The deaths are okay. A dog dies a dog tends to die a lot in the Halloween movies. The thing I like about this movie is the ending, where there's a mysterious man that you keep seeing just the back of him, his cowboy 
white hat, cowboy boots, and this black jacket that he's wearing. And for some reason, this guy shows up at the police station, shoots everybody up, blows up the cell, and helps Michael Myers to escape. That leads us to part six. Part six, where the man in black is still around and in the shadows, and we find out that Jamie is pregnant. Now, I watched both the producer's cut and the original, and let me tell you, never watch the producer's cut. Don't do it. The producer's cut tells us that the baby she's pregnant with is Michael's baby, which means she was forced to have sex with her uncle, and it, it, it's gross. You don't really see the sex, but the way they go about doing it is gross. I like the idea that she was pregnant and kidnapped, not that she was forced to be pregnant by the cult. The cult that is benefiting from Michael Myers killing off his family because they are using his power to gain some sort of witchy control over their lives and their wealth. I love that. I love the fact that there's a cult involved in his origin. I don't need the him being the father of, of the baby storyline. However, part six also introduces us to Paul Rudd, who is amazing in this movie. He plays adult Tommy, who is one of the kids that Laurie Strode was babysitting on the very first Halloween night, and he nails the role. His interactions with Dr. Loomis are amazing, and this is actually Dr. Loomis's, Donald Pleasance's last appearance because he died before this movie was even finished. So part six definitely holds a place in my heart. I think the deaths in this movie are fantastic. I think what happens to the cult is shocking and some of the best sequences in any of the Halloween films. However, they are not in the producer's cut, which is another reason why I don't like the producer's cut. You have to watch the original theatrical version. In the end, the good guys escape, except for Dr. Loomis, who goes back because he has unfinished business with Michael, who was drugged and in a coma. By the time Dr. Loomis goes to visit him, he's been awakened, and we don't see it because, unfortunately, Donald Pleasance was already dead at this point, but Michael Myers kills Dr. Loomis. End of part six, which leads us to part seven, Halloween H2O, 20 years later, which resurrects Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode and gives her a son in Josh Hartnett. This setting instead of being a neighborhood is this boarding school with LL Cool J as a security guard because LL Cool J had to be in all the horror movies back then and he's one of the most lovable characters in the entire movie so I'm not going to complain about it. However, they never address the fact that Laurie Strode had a daughter in Jamie but I'm not sure if they needed to either because if Laurie Strode was in hiding she might have been doing it for her daughter's protection. She might have no idea what happened in part six where her daughter got killed and she started a whole new life and ended up getting a son. So we probably don't need her to talk about her daughter. It would have been nice if they would have acknowledged the fact that she found out that her daughter had died. So her son is about the same age she was when the first Halloween happened. And basically she's in hiding and Michael finds her at this boarding school and her son and hijinks ensue. It has a great opening where we see the original nurse from parts one and two. And Michael uses the nurse and all the information she keeps in her house to find Laurie Strode. There's this whole great death sequence at the beginning and that sets a great tone for the rest of the movie. A couple of great gory deaths of some of Josh Hartnett's friends in the movie and a great sequence at the end where we think that Laurie Strode has finally killed Michael Myers and I wish they would have ended it that way but unfortunately they didn't and we got Halloween Resurrection. The worst in the series. Credit for Buster Rhymes. I thought Buster Rhymes was amazing in this movie. He's doing karate moves. He's watching Bruce Lee movies. He's just funny and I like the fact that they brought in this technology that yes it's old now but it was a very unique way to kind of tell the story of Halloween and Michael Myers in the old Myers house with an audience watching as if it's a found footage film without them knowing that it's really happening. But I didn't really care about any of the characters that were in the house except for maybe Sean Patrick Thomas and his knife tricks when he was trying to kill Michael Myers. Tyra Banks is kind of annoying. I loved her in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air so I don't hate her as an actress but I did not like her in this movie. And the worst part of all, they kill off Laurie Strode at the very beginning. Sorry, that's a huge spoiler right there. And it's so stupid how they erase everything from H2O so that they could put her in this mental institution and set her up to fight Michael Myers at the very beginning and then end up killing her off. Makes me incredibly angry. So no, I'm not a huge fan of Resurrection at all. Okay, now here is where it gets a lot of fun because after Halloween Resurrection, I watched both Rob Zombie adaptations and I gotta tell you, I didn't hate them. It wasn't my first time watching them. I watched part one in the theaters and I actually really liked it. I mean, you really have to understand when you're watching a Rob Zombie horror what you're going into. There's 
gonna be a redneck hillbilly Texas Chainsaw Massacre type theme to it. That's what he loves, that's what he does. However, on top of that, I think we were so used to seeing Michael Myers as this unstoppable killing machine who's a monster and not even human that we never embraced the idea that Rob Zombie had where Michael Myers wasn't an unstoppable killing machine. He was a complete sociopath and his monsterness comes from his mental illness. They paint Dr. Loomis in both of these movies as kind of a failed psychiatrist who was really just trying to write a book. We also get introduced to Michael as a child and we see how his stepdad and his mom interacted with him, how his mom coddled him and eventually committed suicide and left him alone in the psychiatric facility. The Michael Myers in these movies is a much taller, brooding guy, very terrifying to look at. Very much more of a Jason Voorhees type. So I believe that he could take a bullet more than the Michael Myers of the previous movies, even though that Michael Myers was more magical evil than psychological evil. In the second Rob Zombie Halloween, we're introduced to this white horse theory where a person experiencing extreme rage is approached by a white horse in their mind. And the first time I watched that threw me off a bit. I wasn't sure how I felt about it. It kind of took me out of the the movie and I didn't like it that much. Upon rewatch, really focusing on Michael Myers' mental illness and how Laurie Strode was starting to succumb to the same things, really got me back into the movie. And the idea that Laurie Strode might follow in Michael's footsteps as an adult was actually pretty believable and a little terrifying. So if you've watched the Rob Zombie movies only once, I dare you to go revisit them. They're worth it. And that finally brings me to the last movie on my entire watch list and the last movie in the Halloween series. Halloween 2018. The return of Laurie Strode played by Jamie Lee Curtis and the movie that completely erases every movie that happened after the first Halloween. Here's my problem with that. One, let me say this. Halloween 2018 is a fantastic movie, even though I guessed who one of the bad guys was. That wasn't Michael Myers. So it didn't exactly trick my mind. Getting to see Laurie Strode become the reclusive person that she was, seeing its effect on her trying to start a family and what her daughter became, and seeing that affect the next generation in the family was brilliant. I love that. I also felt this great feminine empowerment in having the three females be the ones to take on Michael Myers. I'm a sucker for that kind of movie. However, I feel like Dr. Loomis is a very beloved character in the series. And by erasing everything that happened after one, you erase Dr. Loomis's whole story arc. And I don't think that's fair. Now, have there been a ton of mistakes in those other movies? Yeah, of course there have. Frankly, I think you could have done 2018 by stopping after H2O. You could still have her be his sister. You could still have her have a daughter, as well as a son, as well as a daughter who died, and still play out Halloween 2018 in a very similar fashion. The only thing that would be hard to explain is why this facility could keep Michael contained when all the other facilities couldn't. That's the only thing that probably wouldn't work with that storyline. However, if you take it as it is, as a movie that happens years after the very first Halloween, I think it's like 40 years. It's a great movie with great special effects, a great storyline, a couple of twists in there. You get both adult drama as well as teenage drama, and it's a highly entertaining movie. My fear for the future movies coming out, Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends, is that because Jamie Lee Curtis has signed on to do both of those movies, I'm afraid they're going to use Halloween Kills to kill off her character, and then Halloween Ends is going to be her just in flashbacks. I would hate that. I want her to be alive in both movies. All right, that brings me to the end of the Halloween series. Now, which one is my favorite out of all of them? It's part six, which I know is not a popular opinion because so many people seem to hate the whole Cult of Thorn storyline. And if we're talking part six, the producer's cut, I definitely don't like that. That's horrible. Should not even exist. But part six, the theatrical version, as is, is phenomenal. Has some of my favorite deaths. I love that they brought Jamie's character in, even though it wasn't played by Danielle Harris. I know she was going through kind of a stalking issue probably around that same time so she didn't really want to revive the character or couldn't revive the character at the time. Paul Rudd is amazing. Dr. Loomis is amazing. The cult is incredibly creepy. The adding to the backstory is just something I enjoy and part six is another one of those movies that I kind of grew up with as a kid so definitely gets points for me. Now that also brings me to the end of my entire watch list. Hopefully you've been with me this entire time so let's just come out with it. What was my favorite series out of of all of them. Now you already know Freddy's my favorite villain, but which one is my favorite series?
It's Friday the 13th! I know, I know. On its surface, it seems like such a typical cheesy slasher movie. However, as a series, I feel like it's the most fun to watch. It's the most consistent to watch. And out of all my favorites from each of the series, my favorite favorite is part six, Jason Lives. So I'm gonna give the credit to this silent killer. All right, that brings me to the end of another Graves Corner. Thank you for joining me. Remember, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. Click that big bell icon in case you want to, you know, get notifications when I post my videos. And if you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up and share it with whoever you think might also enjoy it. Follow me at Mary Graves CLE. That's M-A-I-R-E Graves C-L-E on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Take a look at my website, marygraves.com for any updates. And take a look at my Patreon page, which I will link down below. I just dropped the first exclusive content for both tiers two and three. And if you are part of any of the tiers one through three, you will get shout outs at the end of my videos. On top of that, I was just featured on the Heather Loves Horror podcast. And Heather and I are coming out with our own horror movie podcast that will be debuting in the next couple weeks. Details to follow. I will also try to link my episode of her podcast down below. And if you haven't yet, check out Lego Horror Videos series, Killer Clown. Episodes 1 through 8, the entire first season is officially out and over. So you can now watch them one after another and prepare for whenever we're going to be debuting season 2. I play Lucy. That's it for now. Thank you for joining me. And remember, horror is just around the corner. I do want you right there. Come on. Hold it. Hold it. Come on. Cut this evil out of him. All the way back, I'm just, I'm gonna keep using my hands like this because it's fun. Why is my hand itchy? I had never really seen in its entirety. I remember tr <laughs> entire tea. Can't believe I forgot about the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Cause it's crap, that's why. Wah -wah. Classic whodunit movie. And we all... The f How long has that been there? Uh, what's her face? What's her name? Friday the 13th. I'm a... And I bought it on DVD as soon as... As soon as it was a... And I bought it on DVD as soon as it was in As soon. God. And I love that they brought him back for the fam fam. And you do really get attached to Jamie Lee characters. Jamie Lee characters. Except that Tom... In the end, the good guys... Ex in the end, the good guys... Is <laughs> Can I say it? You could still have her be his brother. Wait. So I'm gonna give the credit to this silent killer. Where's the eyes? There's the eyes. Where's the actual claws? Oh, they're there. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha.